how you respond to things exposes you. It reveals you. It shows the character that you have. And listen, we're emotional creatures. There's many times where I respond in anger. I got a temper. Who am I to judge and point the finger at anybody? But I've learned over time to control it. I learned over time to breathe. I learned over time to ask questions. I learned over time to take a minute before I respond to things. And I think what Augury is saying here in his wisdom, be careful what happens with this powerful thing called anger. What's cracking, everybody? My name is Smart Guy, Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. And once again, we got another proverb of the week here. Now we are Proverbs chapter 30, 30 weeks of us unpacking a proverb every week for the last 30 weeks. And uh, we're on the final stretch of Proverbs. The interesting thing about this proverb, it's actually not written by King Solomon. It's actually written by a gentleman by the name of Augur, A-G-U-R, which means gather. It's believed that Augur and his family is believed to have lived during King Solomon's times. He was a wise man. He was somebody obviously that caught King Solomon's attention. This guy obviously has a heart for God in his meetings. It's interesting how he writes these things. There's a bunch of higher laws. I mean, you know, we've looked at Proverbs and uh, generally speaking with King Solomon writing it, it's centered around wisdom, not necessarily knowledge and not necessarily time experience. It's really times both those things together, which creates wisdom. And uh, it's also tied around his perspective of running a kingdom, you know, decisions that he's made from the king's court. Now, obviously, his instruction to children and uh, a lot of things that he also says about money and possessions and prosperity. But uh, this chapter, chapter 30, here is a little different. So it's a lot of contrast, a lot of images that's presented in their heavenly sense uh, from Augur here. And uh, it's not your typical Proverbs that you may have been customarily been reading in the last 29 chapters. So let's go into some of these things. Um, my observation here with Augur is that uh, he's looking at physical images as he con as a contrast that to life's greatest truths. And you know, only those, as uh, Augur, you continue to read here, and I encourage you to do so, is that only those who have the humbleness of heart only those who have the humbleness of heart have the ability to receive instruction from God. I think that oftentimes we get involved in relationships that have disagreements, we have debates, and if you don't have humility in your heart, you are filled with pride and, and ego and you're bullying uh, folks, you try to manipulate many different situations, but you've truly come with a heart of humility, then you receive instruction from the Lord. And um, that's what Agur here sh is sharing here in, in chapter 30 of Proverbs. By the way, I just wanna let you know, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a minister, I'm not a bishop, nothing. I don't, even, I don't even have a college degree, let alone a master's in divinity or religious studies. I'm just an entrepreneur in a congregation trying to unpack what the Bible says about money. So therefore I can lay in my life a set of foundation of values and principles and, and morality that has withstood the test of time. Over 6,000 years of human history is in the Bible. And so instead of me just trying to be a good person, trying to let political parties trying to help me determine what I need to think and how to how to uh, make decisions. I'm going to rely on transcended human history, which I find in the Bible. So some of you agree with that, some of you don't agree with that. And, and by the way, I've put some of that in my first book here ever written, Faith Made Millionaire. Now I used values and principles to go about making decisions. Some of the strife I went through as a single parent, some of the things I went through being married and divorced, filing bankruptcy, I put it in the book. Some of the principles and misconceptions about money, some of the structures I use and formulas I've used to gather wealth, obviously with principles from the Bible. So let's unpack Proverbs chapter 30. Let's jump into it. I'm gonna jump here to Proverbs chapter 30, verse five. It reads like this. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and provide you a liar. So he's literally talking and taking about God and his words. He's not embellishing God's word. He's seeking guidance and wisdom and how it's translated to him. Let's jump right here to verse eight. Keep falsehood and lies from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Verse nine, otherwise I will have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of God. So you see here, Augur says, listen, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be a millionaire, but at the same time too, I don't want to be in poverty. I don't want to be poor. Keep me right in the middle. I think that's where a lot of people want to be. I think a lot of people just want to be comfortable. I think a lot of people just want to be in a position where they're not starving. And uh, it says here, if I do become poor, here I am, I'm going to find myself stealing because he understands his human nature. Once you get into panic mode, when he's experiencing lack, he thinks in his mind is in his history of being a human being that he will steal and take from others and worse, take from God. Let's jump to verse 11 here. He says, there are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. 
Those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not cleansed of their own filth. Those whose eyes are ever so haughty, whose glances are so disdainful, those whose teeth are swords and whose jaws are set with knives to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among mankind. The leech has two daughters. Give, give, they cry. So as you can see that what we're going on in the world today is not anywhere different from where it was back even in biblical times, just with different structures, just with people with suits and ties, just with people with different equipment and technology. It's the same stuff. See, that's why if I'm going to go about making decisions today, regardless of what our country is going through, chances are it's already happened in the Bible. That's why when it comes to me making big decisions in my life, it's got to be grounded on things that I know have transcended the test of humankind. I also want to point out here that he talks about those who curse their fathers and mothers. And some of us may find ourselves in that situation. You grew up in a funky uh, type of situation, bad, horrific, painful situation with a mom and dad. And rightfully so, you can be angry. But I think there's also a time in your life as an adult where you can look back and say, you know what? You're forgiven, mom and dad. I know you're not perfect. You're a human being just like I am. And we often talk about the three phases of how you have a relationship with your parents. The first phase is idolize. Mom and dad are awesome. There's nobody can beat my mom and dad. Nobody can outwork my dad. Nobody can out earn my dad. My mom is awesome. She's a Barbie doll. Nobody's any better than my mom and dad. That's idolized phase. Second phase is demonize. My mom and dad don't understand me. They, don't, they ground me to take away my phone. They don't invest in my business. They don't give me no money, right? These are things that you do now because you're idolized. My mom and dad doesn't understand how it is growing up, yet they were teenagers themselves at one point, yet they don't understand you. So that's the demonized phase. And the third phase is then you humanize. You understand now as a parent. You understand now as a married husband or, or married wife. You look back and your parents say, wow, they did the very best that they could with what they had. And you respect them for that. And you honor them for that. And you forgive them for their lack of decision-making process. You like them for their abuse that you may have done. And by the way, you don't forgive them for them. You forgive them for you. And so I think that's what Agur is saying here in terms of those who curse their fathers and mothers and do not bless their mothers. And there's a detraction from that. And so uh, King Solomon here has mentioned here in, in many different Proverbs how important it is to honor your mother and father in spite of your relationship or what they did or didn't do for you. And I know for some of you, it's a very, very tough pill to swallow. You have some pent up anxiety and anger and frustration when it comes to mom and dad. Um, give this a shot. You know, get to understand why they did what they did. And you can understand their flaws. And some of you might feel sorry for them. You feel sorry for what they did to you and how come they weren't there for you at such critical areas of your life. They may have abandoned you. They may have hurt you. But I'm telling you right now, as you set your eyes further, further, deeper into God's word, the more he wants to use you to minister to other people through that pain. So Argo continues to say here, the things that are never satisfied. What are they? Three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. They are the grave, here in chapter 15 and 16, the grave, the barren womb, land, which is never satisfied with water, and fire, which never says enough. So you have to watch out for these things, or you have to figure out which one of these things you want to continue to feed into, because they're never satisfied. At the recording of the video, I'm still confused about what this really means. Again, I'm not no scholar, but I'm trying to figure out what he's trying to say here because in King Solomon's sayings, there's usually a contrast. There's no contrast here. Well, help me out. Put, your, put in the comment section about what you think. I think that what he's trying to say is this. It says, with all of these things that are never satisfied, you got to find yourself a stable medium and says, man, I'm just content. I understand the situation. I know as much as I feed into this thing, I have to be in a position where, as opposed to other things in life, I have to be saying in my life, when those things are never satisfied, that I'm okay. I, I'm okay with who I am, and I'm gonna let God use me and pour into me, however he wants to use me and pour into me. And I think that's uh, my interpretation of what Agra here is saying. What do you thoughts? Put it in the comment section below. Let's go here into verse 17 about dishonoring parents once again. The eye that mocks a father that scorns an aged mother will be picked up by the ravens of the valley, will be eaten by the vultures. So in spite of what you've been through with your mom and dad, how do you look at them? How do you speak to them or of them or look upon them? Because again, it is in your control of how you go about honoring or dishonoring your parents going forward. And you already know, if you go ahead and dishonor your parents, you know, the reason why you're here is because you share their DNA. They made a baby, and there you are. But if you go about life dishonoring them, I wonder how that translates also into other relationships when people don't do right by you. Because how you treat your parents and how you treat your family, chances are is how you're gonna treat everybody in business, 
in your church, on your team, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Matt, there's a difference between that and my family. I know, but I'm also a big believer in the saying, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And it's easier not to have to be a different person around friends and family versus people at your office and people in your business and people at your team. It's easier to be that whole person that your same person here, there, and anywhere. And let's go to the next one where Agra talks about four small things, yet they're wise. Verse 24 to 28 goes like this. Four things on earth are small, yet they're extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up food in the summer. Hyraxes are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. A lizard can be caught up with the hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. So Agur's observation of these four little small things says, listen, it doesn't have to be a big giant. Things don't have to be this huge monstrosity of a house or a church or a team or a business or a stack of cash. It's the small things that make a big impact. So what small things in your life do you think can make a big impact, an eternal impact, a lasting impact for the long term? So small, we've often said that long-term thinkers benefit and have their vision come true because they made a series of small actions that they followed through with. So when you're looking at four small things like this, the power of ants, hyraxes like rabbits, uh, locusts, and no yet they're still all working together. Somehow, some way, they're all working together for the benefit of their surroundings, the benefit of who they're sheltering and bringing forth in this world. As we wrap up chapter 30, Agra talks about three things that are stately in their stride and four that move the stately bearing. Verse 30, 31, it reads like this. A lion mighty amongst beasts who retreats before nothing, a strutting rooster, a he-goat, basically a male goat, and a king secure against revolt. Think about yourself as a king. What happens if you've got people coming against you? They want to throw you out. How will you act? How will you strut? How will you lean back with bearing or will you be acting with anxiousness and fear? And so he's looking at these animals because they go through their own challenges too as well in the wild and how they act amongst their peers, amongst things that they're fearful of. And so casting those things as a human being, casting those things as a person that can be inspired, strengthened by your relationship with God and say, hey, how do I get past these things and be inspired by mere animals? Let's wrap up here, verse 32 and 33. If you play the fool and exalt yourself or you plan evil, clap your hand over your mouth. For as churning cream produces butter and as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. So you can be the fool in a situation or you can be the wise man in a situation. And oftentimes you're gonna run across conflict. You got a choice in that moment. And sometimes it means taking a breath for some of you, like myself included, have knee-jerk reactions. And so, by the way, we just had a, a great Zoom with Dr. Emerson Egrich, who wrote the book, Before You Hit Send in Love and Respect. And he talked about a very profound thing last, yesterday. He said, how you respond to things exposes you. It reveals you. It shows the character that you have. And listen, we're emotional creatures. There's many times that I respond in anger. I got a temper. Who am I to judge and point the finger at anybody? But I've learned over time to control it. I learned over time to breathe. I learned over time to ask questions. I learned over time to take a minute before I respond to things. And I think what Augur is saying here in his older years, in his wisdom, living life, be careful what happens with this powerful thing called anger. Is it to cause strife? Is it to put people down? Is it used to cause sin? Be careful with that thing. So that being said, guys, we're going to go to chapter 31 next week. By the way, chapter 31 of Proverbs, one of my very favorite Proverbs, but for me, I just want to let you know, Proverbs 30, I'm probably going to be reflecting on this for a long time because it's not your typical King Solomon back and forth, back and forth. He says this, or this is that. Uh, Agur is a little bit more deep. He's a little bit more, as uh, Ivan had mentioned here, a little bit more Yoda-like in his application and his expression of his relationship with God and what God has revealed in his life. So that being said, I'd love to know your thoughts, your questions, your feedback. You agree with me, you don't agree with me. Every week, 30 weeks, we've been putting a proverb, studying King Solomon, the richest and wisest king who ever lived. Please put your comments, your feedback, your questions, your feedback here, whether you agree with me or don't agree, please, we want to know as we grow together here, as we build a seven-figure squad YouTube channel, a channel dedicated to help you think like a millionaire, strategize like a millionaire, so therefore you can become a first-generation cash flow millionaire. If you haven't done so already and you found value in this video, please consider hitting like. 
If you watch a couple of our other videos, and if you've done so yet either, and you've not hit subscribe, please consider doing so and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. That being said, this is your money smart guy from Dallas, Texas. And don't forget to buy Faith Mill Millionaire, number one bestseller on Amazon. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.